So welcome everyone. For, thank you for joining us for this evening's lecture from the Mount San Jacinto Natural History Association. I am Royce Jones, Wilderness Patroller for the Mount San Jacinto State Park and Treasurer for the Natural History Association. First, I'd like to go over little things about using Zoom. Depending on the device that you're using, the setting options locations may vary. First, in the view option, you want to select full screen or you can also do speaker view. That's another terminology that may be used. The video and the audio for the participants has been disabled and should remain so throughout the whole program. You need to only see the host and the speaker. At any time during the presentation, you may click the chat button on your screen, identify yourself and type your question for our speaker to answer at the end of the lecture. Once you have submitted a question, it cannot be retrieved. So for further additional questions, make a new entry. So this evening's speaker is the senior environmental scientist for the California State Parks Inland Empire District. He studied zoology at the Southern Illinois University where he learned or earned a bachelor's of science with a specialization in wildlife management and minored in chemistry. He considers himself lucky to have a career which offers and allows him opportunities to manage the diverse holdings of the state parks in the Inland Empire that span from the very urban open space and the globally significant wildlife corridor of the Chino Hills State Park to the subalpine wilderness of the Mount San Jacinto State Park to the Mojave Desert's ecosystems of Providence Mountains State Recreational Area. Working for the California State Parks allows him the freedom to manage projects from concept to implementation and then to monitor and main them, maintain them as they mature. Please welcome to our Zoom stage, Ken Keetzer for his presentation on Hidden Lake Blue Curls. Ken, the stage is yours. Excuse me. Thank you, Royce. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for everybody uh, who's attending this evening. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to speak to you all this evening. Um, the introduction said most of it, but I'll just add that uh, Inland Empire District is made up of eight state parks presently, uh, Chino, Hill State Park, uh, Cal Citrus State Historic Park in Riverside, uh, Lake Paris State Recreation Area, Silverwood Lake State Recreation Area, uh, a couple small units, um, one in Santa Mateo Canyon and one up near Yucaipa, uh, Wildwood Canyon State Rec Park Unit, of course, Mount San Jacinto, and um, then uh, Providence Mountain State Recreation Area way out in the desert. Um, Providence, most well known for Mitchell Caverns. Um, so, uh, if you haven't visited those units, um, they're all worth a visit, so check them out. Um, I think I'm going to start sharing my screen right away, and we can just get into it. And um, part of that will be a little further introduction. We had this problem once before. I opened it, and nothing showed up, so I'm going to try and do this again. Okay. Here we go. It's trying to open my presentation, I swear. Trying to do some sort of strange saving. Try and open this one more time. It is the challenge of um, Zoom to do this. You guys see my screen yet? Come on.
We had it. We tested it. Yeah, it looks like it wants to shut down and start open again, but we're not in presentation mode yet. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll try this. I'm going to close out of office altogether real quick and uh, try to do this one more time. Okay. Come on. We're almost there. We practice for this very reason. Why is it acting up? I apologize, everyone. It looks like all you need to do is now click on a little screen presentation button at the bottom of your screen. How's everybody doing? Can you see that now? Got it. All right, success, all right. So in like blue pearls, okay. Um, imagine if you will, Ken Keetzer, much younger looking and younger than I am now. I started with the Inland Empire District 16 years ago. Um, and shortly after I started, literally within the first few weeks of my term as the environmental scientist for the Inland Empire District, I received a call, uh, essentially a code call, um, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And this individual, Jonathan Snapcook, um, called me and said, um, hey, how's, 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 how's Trichostoma austro-montanum subspecies compactum doing? And um, of course, I, I had been here for a couple of weeks and had not even scratched the surface of uh, getting through, seeing all of our parks or um, navigating and, and rifling through and getting to know all the files on the shelves in my office. So um, I honestly didn't even know that Hidden Lake existed at that point. Um, so I did a little research, dug into the files, learned from Jonathan that um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service tries to do uh, a five-year review on um, listed species. And uh, at the time, the Hidden Lake blue pearls were a federally listed species. Uh, threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, and so it was his assignment to do that five-year review and figure out what was um, going on with the plant or the species. And, um, you know, if, if we could take some steps towards recovery. And so that was the beginning of the journey. And uh, here's a photograph uh, of the plant itself. It's a... Uh, um, so, you know, um, I got to know a little bit about the species. I took a hike out to Hidden Lake um, and uh, started looking at it, looking at the files, learned the background, and, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Um, so, um, you know, everything you need to know is in, in this 47 page document. Um, won't take you long to read. I joke, um, of course. Um, but if you want to look up really great details, you can Google the Federal Register, and um, there are several documents on there that go into great detail about the reasons for the listing of the species, the background on um, the management of the plant, and, and so on. And um, I'll get into some more of that here in a moment. Um, the basics, Hidden Lake Blue Curls, um, they're an annual flowering plant. Uh, in the mint family. Um, annual meaning they are um, germinate from seed every year and go through their life cycle and uh, die uh, rather than uh, biannuals or perennial plants um, that, that live more than one season. Um, 
there is a closest close relative, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we get further on into the presentation, but um, ours at Hidden Lake is subspecies compactum, and there is the subspecies Osramontanum. And uh, you'll get to see the distinctions between the two plants um, in a moment. Um, the Osramontanum subspecies is got a little wider distribution and not such a narrow habitat um, specialization. Um, so we'll look at that in just a moment as well. Um, Hidden Lake blue curls themselves are referred to as a narrow endemic uh, native to California. Um, endemic refers to the fact that they um, only exist in California. And in this case, they're endemic to Mount San Jacinto State Park. Um, they are only found um, within the two acres that make up the margins of Hidden Lake at Mount San Jacinto State Park. Um, we have done some looking around um, and there is no evidence that they occur anywhere else, um, anywhere near the range of the Ostromontanum subspecies. Um, Hidden Lake blue curls were listed federally in 1998 and uh, California Na Native Plant Society still list lists them as seriously endangered. Um, the state endangered species list uh, does not cover uh, Hidden Lake blue curls. There aren't, the, the state of California's endangered species list uh, is not as comprehensive as um, the federal list or the CNPS list. They just don't cover plants as well, frankly. And it's not as updated, I don't think. Um, probably due to the CDFW's uh, limited resources to, to update that list and, and do the background to uh, assess the need for listing. And the federal agency, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that oversees their list does have much more resources and does a pretty good job. Um, so the original listing was due to threats from trampling from horses, hikers, small population size, and having a localized distribution. Um, Hidden Lake was a popular recreational destination. Um, we don't see many people when many horses on the trails at Mount San Jacinto today. There are some, but um, there was a time when there were more horses um, and Hidden Lake was a destination for horseback riders. They stopped there, they'd water their horses and they'd take their horses right out to the edge of the lake. And as you can imagine with such a small diminutive plant, a horse steps on it, it's gonna have its impact. Um, picnickers used to go out there quite a bit as well. And as you can imagine, um, we'll look at some more photos of the lake, but um, if you didn't know better, and or have somebody tell you not to picnic right on the edge of the lake, um, you would do so. And um, that is exactly where these plants grow. So um, picnickers and recreationalists would go down to the edge of the lake and enjoy their time there. And that impacted the uh, success of the plants getting through their life cycle. Of course, small population size and localized distribution. Um, much of the evidence for the proposed listing came from um, one plant biologist's um, research. Um, there were others that did a little bit here and there, but this woman, Ellen Botter, did a lot to um, provide the information that led to the listing. Um, and then, of course, the success, um, and we'll tell the story of the in-between and the management of Hidden Lake Blue Curls to get to this stage, but um, it was delisted due to recovery in July 20 of eight, 2018. And recovery is the operative word there, the big deal, um, because some species are delisted because they go extinct. Some species are never delisted very few species are delisted due to recovery. So it's a big deal and something I'm quite proud of to have been part of um, a conservation team, a partnership with uh, mostly Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden, other state parks personnel, 
and um, other state uh, uh, folks at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so here's here's the difference. Um, these are not the most brilliant photos, but um, and and it takes some creativity to see the distinction. But compactum refers to the compact nature of these plants in comparison to slightly more uh, slender and elongated growth form um, of the Ostra montanum subspecies. Um, we did some work with uh, a Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden um, to test whether compactum was really a circumstance of them growing at Hidden Lake or if it was actually a genetic distinction that, you know, in any circumstances, they would grow in the more, more compact growth form, um, i.e. if we, we grew them out in the, in the greenhouse at, at the botanical garden. And that gave us evidence that the compact growth form was not just a factor of growing at Hidden Lake and the uh, ecological conditions there, um, that it was genetic in uh, its origin. And so that gave us indications that they really did belong uh, separately genetically or, you know, uh, in sub separate subspecies. And, and I'll touch on this a little bit more at the end of our talk, because um, we want to do a little bit more research into this. And we just have to find the time and the resources to do some more research into their genetics. Um, we might find something more interesting out there uh, on that topic. Um, so here's some maps of the range of in Lake Blue Curls and the compact uh, Ostrom Montanum subspecies. So you see on the left the uh, notations and mapping of in Lake Blue Curls, and I, I mostly put this up because it made me laugh. There's, um, you know, a couple dots clustered together that are at Hidden Lake in Mount, at Mount San Jacinto, and there's one dot um, off on the county line there, um, and that is Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden, where <laughs> they grew out the uh, specimens, uh, and that uh, location is listed as um, cultivated, not wild. Um, and then on the right, uh, gives you a little bit of a feel for how widespread the Ostrom montanum subspecies is. And you can see quite a number of dots in the San Bernardinos and south in the Santa Rosas and beyond, and then even up into the Tehachapi's and Sierras. So um, it's pretty widespread. Um, I'd really like to get up there and see some of those uh, spots in the Sierras. They seem pretty far fled far flung from the um, main populations down south. But uh, anyhow, just a reference for the variability in these two plants as far as range. Um, so here's some, some maps of Hidden Lake and its environs. Um, the main inset there is the de defined boundary of Hidden Divide Natural Preserve. And I'll talk a little bit more about the distinction of a natural preserve and some other the other um, distinctions of various units in the state park system and what they what they mean and how we manage the lands differently in a moment. Um, the other insets to the right show the larger area um, in the upper right corner uh, you see the Salton Sea and the large green mass there below, you know, below Mount San Jacinto and to the west of Salton Sea is Zanza Borrego. Um, and then, of course, you see Mount San Jacinto State Park there. Um, so Mount San Jacinto State Park, uh, there was some, some action that, you know, took place before its actual dedication. And that's a little bit of complicated history, but the, it officially became a state park in 1933. Um, the acreage for the park is approximately 13,700 acres, 9,900 9, acres are state wilderness. Um, one of the things that I think is really 
special or, or important to note is that there's a lot of open space around um, Miles Henderson State Park that kind of makes the park and the wilderness feel bigger. Of course, most of you who are familiar with the area know that the National Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, um, manages the San Jacinto Ranger District of the San Bernardino National Forest, both to the north and to the south of the park, adding um, well over 30,000 acres of open space and mostly additional wilderness. Um, there's some Bureau of Land Management land, some tribal land, some local parks, and all that really adds up, and, and even some undeveloped land um, just outside of Palm Springs. But anyhow, so it really makes that 13,700 acres feel like much more. Um, so anyhow, and then of course, I'll note in red that uh, we have the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway that um, for better or worse, and, and on any given day, I might look at it either way, um, brings many, many visitors um, to the mountain, to the state park. And, you know, the good part of it is, is that lots of people get to experience um, the state park and, and the wilderness that wouldn't otherwise. And uh, just because they, they come up for the day to experience the tram and then they go, oh, hey, there's a state park out here. Let's take a little bit of a hike. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to interpret the wilderness and, and so on and so forth. So they get a taste of it and many come back. Um, on the flip side, that kind of visitation is a challenge for managing and protecting the natural and cultural resources of the unit. And so um, it's, a, it's a bit of a catch-22. Um, whole separate presentation, as I alluded to. Um, so anyhow, uh, shortly after the listing, uh, State Parks, DPR, Department of Parks and Recreation, is what that acronym stands for, uh, began work on a general plan for the park. General plan is like any municipal general plan. It's just a guiding document of how we're going to manage the park based on state parks policies um, and um, the resources that we're entrusted with at that unit, um, which included the establishment of Hidden Divide Natural Preserve. Um, seems to me that this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about a few distinctions in the designations of different state park units real quickly. Um, with a state park, um, our policy suggests that we try to balance um, sort of a three-way balance between managing for recreation and protecting and preserving cultural and natural resources. Um, in a state recreation area like Lake Paris, we still trying to maintain a pretty good balance, but um, we manage for recreation a little more than we might otherwise. And we provide opportunities for some different recreational opportunities or recreational uh, choices, recreational op options. Um, that aren't options at normal state parks, for instance, at Lake Paris. Um, and this is not the case with every recreation area. So know the rules of every park that you go to, but at Lake Paris during certain seasons and in certain locations, we allow some upland game hunting. We allow boating and fishing. Um, so, uh, and then in a, a natural preserve, which is a subunit um, of a state park, um, we manage for the natural or cultural resources that that preserve was designated for over and above the recreational values of the park as a whole. So it gives us abilities to, to limit the recreational outlets that people might have, um, i.e., for example, um, closing an area temporarily to recreational use altogether or um, requiring that people stay on the trails. Um, most people don't realize this and I don't want to advocate for off trail hiking, but um, unless you are doing specific resource damage in a state park um, and, and routinely hiking the same route can amount to resource damage because it tramples plants and 
um, can lead to erosion and stuff, volunteer trails, but it is not technically illegal to hike off trail unless you're causing some sort of resource damage. And then it is a citable offense. So consider that. Um, so anyhow, uh, moving on, Hidden Divide Natural Preserve is 255 acres within the wilderness of the park. And I'll just talk quickly about the wilderness designation as well. Um, wilderness is, a, is basically a roadless area and there are some limitations on um, the type of recreational uses in those roadless areas, wilderness areas. Um, we have some signage in a wilderness area, but we might tend to, to try and um, reduce the total amount of it and the size of the signage. In fact, I will say that um, the signs at Hidden Lake Blue Cro at Hidden Lake presently are a little bigger than I think are appropriate. And at some point they will probably need to be replaced because of weathering. And we may present the same material, but I will probably reduce the size of those signs just to align better with the wilderness ethics and aesthetic that we are supposed to be managing out there. Um, Another thing that uh, we did out there, we, we tried to limit the access to horseback riders uh, to the lake um, by putting in a primitive fence. Um, it's a symbolic barrier and it's not easy for a horseback rider to get over. So it worked pretty well. And as I said, there's a lot less use of by the park of horseback riders in general. So it's less of a issue in general at this point. Um, the lake as a body of water was removed from all park produced maps to disguise its existence from visitors. Um, standing bodies of water are recreational attractions and people want to go sit there and enjoy them. And we understand that, but at the time we were trying to discourage visitation um, to limit the impacts to the Hidden Lake Blue Curls. Um, and finally, um, a superintendent's closure order was ordered a place for off-trail hiking in the Hidden Divide Natural Preserve. And at the time, the only officially designated trail through the preserve did not pro provide access to Hidden Lake. It was the Willow Creek Trail that was simply a through hike out towards the National Forest. Um, so that effectively made it a citable offense to visit Hidden Lake. And again, this was all done knowing that it was an attractive recreational um, out, uh, you know, place to go recreate, but um, it was our obligation uh, to uphold the Federal Endangered Species Act and look towards um, looking after those listed plants on CNPS watch list. Um, so temporarily, at least closing off that site to see um, what needed to be done um, was a, a challenging or difficult, but strong uh, and important decision, I think. Uh, so here's, uh, and this was all, I should say, uh, largely done before I came to the Inland Empire District. Um, the general plan was completed in 2002. I started, uh, I want to say in 2005. Um, the symbolic fencing for the horses was put up sometime in that area too. Um, so, and the, the natural preserve was established in that time. Um, so a lot of this part, this, this historic stuff was done before I started. Um, so here's an example on the left is a state parks produced map. And you can see uh, right there where the text for Hidden Divide Natural Preserve is. There's it, behind the text, there's a, a vacant spot. And on the federal map on the right, um, still shows the body of water. The federal government would not um, listen to our request or heed our request, um, which is fine. Um, but anyhow, it was one of the actions we took. It just discouraged people from visiting that site if they didn't know there was a body of water there. And of course, as many of you know, who hike there, um, that, that body of water isn't always there. So um, anyhow, knowing 
in in the um, Ellen Botter's uh, recommendations uh, from some of her research, she she had a few suggestions of what we you know an entity like state parks might want to do to try and secure the the plant uh, and help it towards recovery or protection and safety. Um, and so anyhow, we, uh, we have here in this photo, um, myself in the center, on the left, Jonathan Snapcook from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and on the right, Naomi Fraga with uh, Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden, um, now California Botanical Garden. Um, through the US Fish and Wildlife Service, we received a grant um, titled Showing Success. It was intended for to, to help along um, entities uh, who had potential opportunity to take steps towards recovering a, a listed or protected species. And um, there was a seemingly good pathway towards recovery here. Um, so one of the things that we struggled with in the state parks is we had this map, uh, but it was just a polygon on a map. It, it didn't have a legal description um, behind it. And a legal description is what would help uh, if a ranger cited somebody for violating the rules of the natural preserve, for example, um, somebody could go to court and even, you know, you could point your finger at a boundary on a map, but it wouldn't hold up necessarily because we didn't have that legal description and they could say, well, I didn't know where I was. And it's a flimsy argument perhaps, but I think a lawyer could, could get somewhere with that. So we had our um, uh, folks do a legal description and, and map it out and certify it. And so that way we, we could cite people if we needed to for violations. Um, we needed to put signage out. Um, you know, again, we had this thing on a map, but we didn't have a sign in the wilderness on the trail that said now entering Hidden Divide Natural Preserve. So um, we put some signs out. Um, seed banking and germination studies. Rancho Santa Ana has great facilities for um, one of their, their biggest programs is seed banking, storage of seed, preservation of seed of rare um, species, uh, mostly from California, but probably, in, I believe, in some of the surrounding states. Um, and so that way, if there was some sort of critical event and suddenly Hidden Lake Blue Curls blinked out, um, we would have that bank of genetic material to consider how or what we might want to do with um, a reintroduction program or seeing if there's another location that this plant could be introduced to in the wild or um, you know any number of options. Um, and then germination studies, as I referred to earlier, we wanted to verify that um, the compact nature of the growth form of this plant wasn't still uh, just an uh, effect of its site conditions at Hidden Lake. Um, and along the further, further activities, um, most um, endangered species have what's referred to as a recovery plan written for them. I shouldn't say most, I, I don't know the answer to that, but they're supposed to, let's put it that way. And many do. And these recovery plans can be long. And, and of course, for a species that um, has a widespread uh, range, they, they can be challenging to come up with a, a comprehensive document. Um, in the case of Hidden Lake Blue Curls, it was localized, small population, all these things. So a full recovery plan wasn't really deemed necessary, but we, we kind of did this um, abbreviated document called a conservation strategy. And that was written in partnership by um, state parks and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Botanical Garden. Um, so that kind of became a part, uh, part of our guiding documentation on, on what we wanted to do for managing this plant. Um, and uh, 
it also led to a formal monitoring protocol. In the early days, we'd go out to Hidden Lake and we'd just try and count all the plants. And uh, in dry years, counting, you know, several hundred to a few thousand plants is mm, perhaps feasible. But um, you'll see later that we had years where the population just exploded and it was completely impossible for individuals to count every plant when you had something in the neighborhood of 250,000 plants. It's just, especially we'll see, you know, you saw the early photo that it's a very small plant, just, you know, it's not like counting trees. Um, so anyhow, um, the monitoring plan is, uh, well, we'll talk more about that in some of the future slides because it'll be easier to describe, uh, but it's basically a, a way where we can count a subset of the population and extrapolate using statistics to gauge how many plants are out there. Um, further uh, on here, we had some, we, we had some funds there to, to hire people to, to hang out at Hidden Lake more regularly and monitor what kind of use was actually happening at Hidden Lake. Was the visitor use at the time actually a detriment to the plant? Did people still go out there and picnic on top of the plants or was that kind of a thing of the past? Um, and we also wanted to see if we could um, record distinctions in the microclimate at Hidden Lake. Um, so we put up a weather station out there and that's intended to compare to weather data that we collect in Long Valley outside the ranger station and uh, from our remote automated weather station, which is also targeted at fire weather. Um, so anyhow, here's a map and to the right in the fine print is the really detailed legal description of the boundaries of the natural preserve. Um, this is the final project from our survey unit. Um, this was a sign uh, that was put up. Uh, we have different signs out there now. Uh, these were damaged in the mountain fire um, but much of the text is the same. And these are referring to some, one of my earlier comments, these signs are a little bigger than I felt was appropriate for the wilderness. So we made the replacement signs a little smaller. Um, they're still, they still need to be seen, but they're not quite as large as this. Um, this is Hidden Lake Blue Curls growing in the, the garden at, or the, in the, nursery at the botanical garden. This is the offsite uh, cultivated reference on the range map. Um, and this is the cover page from our uh, conservation strategy, uh, which probably can be found online. Um, or you can reach out to me. Um, and as I said, Early on, we were out there trying to count each and every plant, and it just became impractical, especially when we had large numbers of plants. Uh, you can see on the right, they're you know interspersed with other plants, and uh, you know I didn't try and count, but there's probably 20 plants in that screenshot on the right. So you can imagine what covering a couple acres would be like. Um, looking at something like that, it's, it'll, it'll cross your eyes pretty quickly. Um, so you guys aren't necessarily expected to uh, absorb all this, but basically this is yellow is the, uh, it's just a sample of what could be the occupancy of the plant. Um, and uh, what we do is we lay out a transect, uh, the red line there, uh, it's 75 meters and, or, no, it's 100 meters, excuse me. The laterals, the quadrats, one, 0 0.5 meters by 75 meters um, are the subsets that we count. And every 10 meters, we use a random number generator to generate some randomness. So we're not counting the same uh, ground every year uh, and essentially counting the offspring of the same plants. Um, it helps helps make the statistics uh, better 
for our population estimates. So we count that small percentage in the white of the population and there's a complex formula that then extrapolates that and gives us an estimation of the population. And truthfully, we don't need to know exactly how many plants are out there in any given year. What we need to do is track trends. And if we have a trend where there's a long term downtrend where we have very few or a couple of years, you know, extended period where we have no plants, then we have to think about um, what management actions we might need to take. Um, and uh, that might start by just simply doing increased monitoring, seeing if we've missed some something out there or monitoring the conditions of the site a little bit more. Um, or it might mean, might trigger thinking about um, what to do with that seed bank at the botanical garden if we need to start putting that to use. Fortunately, um, in the years that we've been monitoring, there hasn't been, there's been evidence actually that the population is very stable um, and with the limits on recreation, um, we're doing pretty well out there. And uh, we expect to be continuing this monitoring. That's the other thing. I mean, it was the, the population analysis that had gone on prior to what we're doing now was sporadic at best. And it just, gave you a snapshot rather than a long-term trend of what was happening with these populations. Um, we refer to these small plants as belly flowers. So um, you're laying on your belly or on your hands and knees, counting and measuring plants. And uh, you know, it's a fun day in the field, but uh, can be tedious. Um, some years we have when the, when the lake is wet long into the summer, we have Western toads that come from far and wide to breed and lay eggs in the pond. And at the right time of year, there are many, many thousands of Western toads emerging from the pond and hopping around the perimeter of the lake when we are trying to count hidden lake blue curls and they are very difficult not to step on. And of course, none of us want to step on and smash a baby toad. Um, so it's, it's a pretty tedious and tiptoeing event when we have this same sort of conjunction. On the right hand sc screen, it's hard to see, but there's at least 50 toads in that picture. And they're all about <clears throat> an inch long. And there are times when the ground just feels like it's moving. Um, an interesting fact that uh, sort of shocked me, and, and uh, you know, I, I, somebody did a master's project back in the 1970s uh, monitoring these toads. And um, toads are not like frogs, they uh, leave the water um, and live in the upland, except for during their mating season, and they move from Hidden Lake, They're, they were documented. Um, emerging from Hidden Lake and traveling over land as far as Long Valley and Round Valley. Um, Round Valley is, ah, I looked it up once. It's well over a mile, um, several miles. Um, and of course, Long Valley is just over a mile from Hidden Lake. So the fact that these little toads travel through the forest um, that far is shocking and impressive to me. Um, so, you know, Hidden Lake varies from year to year. Um, this year it dried up and looked much like it does in that lower right hand corner. Um, by late February, early March, um, sometimes it looks like that does in that middle photo well into, you know, the fall and there's water in it all year round, depending on the winter and the summer heat and monsoonal. Uh, rainstorms and of course uh, some years uh, depending on the snowfall it looks like uh, it does there in the middle photo in uh, you know February and sometimes um, it's full to overflowing and um, there is a, an overflow point um, out towards the towards the southeast uh, of the 
the pond if it gets to that capacity limit. Um, I don't think it's ever a roaring, raging rapid or anything like that, but there is an overflow point. Um, so in 2012, uh, we had an estimated 243,000 plants at Hidden Lake. That was our high mark. Um, and it's fluctuated. We had another banner year in 2017. I was just out there last week um, doing this year's monitoring and I don't have the numbers in hand just yet. Um, haven't done the calculations, but um, it was a reasonable year considering the dry weather. And, you know, the thing to take from this is that we can have some extremely dry years um, and in the soil, the seed seems to survive and persist um, throughout the driest seasons, years, and then you can have a better year. Um, and conditions, there's no specific, okay, um, a super wet year means hundreds of thousands of blue curls because if it's too wet, the pond is full and um, Hidden Lake blue curls don't grow underwater. So there's limited available uh, ground for these things to grow on. And um, certain types of, so, you know, a, a super wet year doesn't necessarily mean lots of blue curls. And, uh, you know, a super dry year, it, it, it's more important when the precipitation comes and um, how much available ground there is. Um, you'll note in 2016, and I would have to look back, but it was one of the driest periods on record in California. And um, even that year, we still had 93 identified plants. And that was a year when we just went out there and creeped around on our hands and knees and, and looked for the plants. So, um, you know, it's possible even if you look back that some of the the listing may not have been fully necessary. State parks maybe could have done something about the recreation, but it catalyzed a lot of things that led to the protection and I think better management of this. So anyhow, um, moving on, like I said, the key is um, it rebounds or seems to um, after difficult years and uh, as we continue to monitor, we'll see more of this and uh, we'll be able to monitor the longer trend and see what things look like and then make monitors, monitoring decisions based on the recommendations and the conservation strategy and the delisting monitoring plan, which I'll talk about shortly. And um, that'll hopefully lead to the persistence of this uh, species. Um, so as, I alluded to earlier in the presentation, you know, it was a recreational attraction before um, it was listed. And part of the reason it was listed because it was so attractive. When the pond is dry, there's still a really beautiful overlook, overlooking the valley, views of the Salton Sea, views of the San Andreas Fault, views of the desert cities, views of you know, the western edge of Joshua Tree National Park. Um, so we knew that it was some place people wanted to go. People did continue to sneak out there, um, those who knew and uh, disobey the superintendent's closure order, even when it was closed. Um, so we, once we had some indications that the population of the plant was stable, we started considering, okay, can we introduce some managed recreation into the site. Um, and so that led to the conception of a trail plan. Um, this is, um, you know, the, the access to Hidden Lake historically had been, you know, uh, an undesignated cross country route essentially from Willow Springs Trail out to Hidden Lake and, and, and out to the Overlook. And it, it had been on some, some maps, but it wasn't officially designated during the general planning process uh, for the state park. 
And on this map, you'll see that the approximation of the historic route was pretty close to the edge of the water. And, and quite frankly, it was just people wanted to go walk by the edge of the water. Um, and people went on both sides of the pond and, and so on and so forth. And so we looked at the idea of, um, okay, if we're gonna do this, we can, State Parks has a pretty robust trails program and our trails program has designed a, an approach to building trails that is intended to build uh, trails that are sustainable and that by that I mean um, long lived with limited maintenance, but also intended to allow um, the trail to exist with limited impacts on um, natural features like drainage and things like that in the state parks. Um, this was kind of a joke. I originally presented this for some uh, state parks uh, folks. And uh, this, this here is my predecessor, Gary Hund. Um, he was managing Mount San Jacinto State Park for a period before I started here and uh, left state parks and uh, had a, a variety of jobs. But at the time we were planning this trails project, he was working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And he ended up being instrumental in uh, helping us get approval for the trail. Um, so it was a good thing that he was there, frankly. Um, and here's some photos of the trail construction itself. Um, we build these things. In this case, on the left, you see that big rock with the trail kind of humped up in the middle. It's intended if there's sheet flow of water that comes from the uphill side where the wheelbarrow is, that big rock is placed there such that the water can flow under the footprint of the trail through the cracks in that rock. And it won't affect the surface flow of that water. It's intended we have little drainages. It's hard to see in here. I know what I'm looking at, but there's little hard, hardened drainage structures so that if there's actually a, even a micro drainage, we harden that and allow um, water to pass through. We didn't want unwanted erosion to factor into um, sed sedimentation in the basin of Hidden Lake. And additionally, we didn't want this trail to limit uh, water access to filtering into the basin as well. Um, in fact, there was a, a large storm during the construction of this trail that gave us an indication that there was a shortcoming in the design and we were designed it, redesigned it um, in part uh, due to some of the flow patterns that we saw. Um, so anyhow, just you, many of you have probably gotten permits and hiked this trail um, and many of you will after this presentation if you haven't and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how we control access here. That was one of the stipulations the US Fish and Wildlife Service had. When we were doing this, um, the plant was still listed and they had a lot of concerns about us reintroducing recreation to this area. Um, you will also notice on this slide um, in the red that although it doesn't look like much, the new trail footprint is further away from the water and it is up slope and away from the actual population of Hidden Lake Blue Curls. We've never found any Blue Curls up anywhere near where the trail footprint is. So we weren't taking up any habitat or available ground where the Hidden Lake Blue Curls could be growing when we put this new trail in. Um, we put some interpretive signage out there so that we could talk about the Vernal Lake, uh, the Vernal Pool, um, and just a little bit about the biology of some of the sense that, you know, the Hidden Lake Blue Curls and the western toads and uh, some of the other native plants that occur there. We put in these, uh, you know, this fencing, it's symbolic, of course, anybody could just cross over it, but um, hopefully it helps delineate the trail and keep people from going down to the water's edge. Um, and it seems to be so far. Um, so this is a lot of text, but one of the other things that 
we did um, was, you know, we had historically a, a hidden uh, a superintendent's closure order. And a superintendent's closure order, for those who don't know anything about state parks, is um, meant to last for a year and then it has to be reissued. And doing that forever is not the intent. Um, so we looked at changing the regulations and, and ultimately um, my intent was to have a regulation just for Hidden Divide Natural Preserve. It uh, caught somebody's eye at Sacramento level and they decided maybe this is a good idea for all state parks or natural preserves or cultural preserves in the state park system to keep people on trails. And um, so that caught some traction and it went someplace. And uh, along the way, it caught some attention at Anzabrigo Desert State Park, um, because there are some places, there are some very large natural preserves out there and there are some attractions that you can't get to without going off trail. Um, so we had to put some caveats in this uh, text uh, that allowed for superintendents to leave certain you know, natural preserves open to off trail hiking, um, which is fine. Um, so in localized areas, it is still a permitted activity, but in general, it is not a permitted activity to hike off trail in natural or cultural preserves anywhere in the state park system. We came up with a, with a permitting process. Uh, most of you have been to Hidden Mount Tennessee State Park. I would sure surely know that we have a wilderness permit. Um, it is free and it allows you to take a group of 15 out um, into the wilderness hiking and it's mostly just to track people and make sure they make it in and out of the wilderness. Okay. Um, we have a separate permitting uh, process to go to Hidden Divide Natural Preserve and hidden, you hike the Hidden Lake Trail. Um, many people don't know this and that's one of the reasons why um, I was really happy to talk about this now um, is to, to reiterate the conditions to go to Hidden Lake and that is um, we have a smaller group size. Um, the wilderness permit allows 15 people in your group. The group size for Hidden Divide Natural Preserve is five. Um, we limit the number of permits we issue per day, which we don't do with wilderness permits. We limit, we, we have an unlimited number of wilderness permits that we issue per day. Um, the permit limit for Hidden Divide Natural Preserve is 30 for a day. So any given day, no more than 30 people are allowed at Hidden Lake. Um, and we actually don't issue permits every day. Um, it says on here, no overnight camping is permitted and that's true, um, but we really only allow permitted camping and permitted campgrounds, but it's just important to add for this. Um, and it talks about staying on designated trails. Um, oh, you know what? I was mistaken. It's not five people in a group. It's six. Um, no pack animals um, and no smoking within the preserve or the wilderness. So just some added things. Um, the other thing is we don't really advertise that this exists. Um, this was another one of the concessions to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They didn't want us publicizing this. This is uh, destination hike that's within a mile of the ranger station and the tram and um, we didn't want uh, people going oh we can't get a permit well we're just going to go there anyway and that would be a, a, a management issue and we'd have to have rangers out there sighting people all the time. Um, it is intended to be um, non-discretional. Um, all you know citations for violation of codes penal codes and things like that are generally discretional. A, a ranger or a peace officer can give you a warning. Um, the management of Mount Sinisino State Park has been told that you are supposed to cite people for this if you are caught hiking off trail within the preserve or without a permit. Um, that's up to the rangers to implement, but that is the intent. Okay, so getting to the delisting. Um, there was a long process of an analysis that went into the delisting. A lot of 
experts outside of state parks, outside of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, outside of Rancho Santa Ana were consulted um, to make sure that our assessment of the condition of the plant was reasonable and that it met the criteria for delisting. And it uh, ultimately passed muster and was delisted. Now I will add that um, there's a 15 year monitoring period um, after delisting during which if there is a crisis or a problem, um, it can be fast tracked to relisting and put back on the endangered species list and get the full protection of the act. Um, so we will continue to monitor. Um, so, um, you know, we got a long way to go to get through that 15 years and, and hopefully it goes well, but uh, it's still got some protections and it's still got the full protections of um, the state parks management uh, policies on it. Um, so that was another one of the big reasons that it was candidate for delisting is it, it, the entire population exists within a, a state park and a state natural preserve in the wilderness. And so there are a lot of protections that just automatically come with that um, as long as we enforce those protections. So um, we had intentions of opening this trail after it was completely built. Um, we had the mountain fire, many of you remember that in 2013. And then again, literally we were talking about, we had plans to open the, the trail um, and then the Cranston fire happened. Um, so uh, you'll see in that picture on the right hand side, uh, during the mountain fire, fire backed right down to the edge of the lake. Um, I met the fire crews out there. I was super impressed with the hotshot crew that was out there working there. It was a really nice creeping ground fire at that point and um, not terribly threatening or dangerous. And they cut the smallest, lowest impact um, control line along the edge of the Hidden Lake Basin and stopped the fire from burning through the basin. Um, and so the fire did not impact the population of Hidden Lake Blue Curls at all. Um, and I was really pleased with that. Um, and so after the fires, um, you know, some of the trails uh, in the national forest are still closed and, and probably will remain so for some time. So uh, it's, it's nice to be able to have the state park fully open at this point. Um, so we're getting to the end here, uh, future management and monitoring. Um, we will and do continue to do population monitoring and reporting to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we maintain the signage. As I mentioned, some of the signs got damaged in one of the fires, we replaced them. Um, there are signs at the Hidden Lake uh, itself as well that need maintaining. Um, we will maintain the trail. Um, State Parks has uh, statewide trails crew are doing work in Round Valley Meadow or Round Valley Campground in Long Valley. Most of you probably are aware of the work they're doing. Um, they will go out periodically or local state park staff will go out and just do little touch-ups to make sure that the trail is operating the way we intended to, to make sure that the drainage into the basin is not causing some sort of unwanted erosion um, or limiting access of runoff into the pond. Um, continued partnership with the, the Botanical Garden. It's been an outstanding partnership and, and we've been really lucky, fortunate that one of the key players in that partnership, Naomi, Naomi Fraga, has been with the garden uh, through this whole period. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's been good because I've been here and she's been there. And so we've been able to, you know, continuity there has been really helpful to maintain this partnership. Um, if we can, we'll, we, we currently monitor the population once a year. Um, if funds become available, we might try and do um, some monitoring a little earlier in the year and a little later in the year in addition to the monitoring that we do now to see how the population matures over the season and or if uh, we find some anomalies where certain years under certain conditions the population matures earlier rather than later. 
and vice versa. The phylogenetic study. This is something I mentioned earlier a little bit or touched on. Um, we talked about the distinctions between uh, subspecies Ostrom montanum and subspecies compactum. Well, there's even some discussion that um, it may really qualify as its own species, and it may actually be closer, more closely related to other species in the family, uh, the, this genus uh, Trichosoma. Um, vinegar weed uh, that you see in many places at lower elevations is another Trichosoma species. Looks to me like essentially the same plant, just bigger and more robust. And at Lake Paris, we have it certain years, it's everywhere. Very uh, <laughs> fragrant. Um, the uh, woolly blue curls is a Trichosoma species, a shrubby species, really large, um, uh, commonly found in the Santa Monica Mountains and other places. Um, so there's pretty wide or pretty diverse uh, phylogeny or expression of genes in the, the group of uh, plants known as Trichostoma. And so it is possible with some more genetic study that Hidden Lake Blue Curls could be its own, um, uh, excuse me, um, species. So we'll see if we can find some funding for that down the road. Um, you know, you never know when uh, there's going to be emerging science that gives us some new tool to better monitor uh, plant populations. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, the California Botanical Garden is uh, definitely in the cutting edge of advancing science. So um, we'll look to them for that mostly. And then as I mentioned, um, if there is some evidence of long-term decline or, or something, um, in this 15 year window, it'll be relisted, you know, with a snap of fingers essentially. Um, so that's, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, that's my end, the end of my presentation. Um, I guess we can, uh, talk a little bit and I'll try and field a few questions at this point. That was a very comprehensive uh, and interesting talk. I, uh, at the moment, we don't have a lot of questions, but uh, uh, I do have a question and you were talking about the phylogeny or you referred to it briefly. And um, I'm trying to imagine in my mind, trying to imagine uh, how this particular subspecies or perhaps now could be considered as a species. He, how, the, the timeline for the isolation and the differentiation, uh, I, I suppose that there's some species out there, perhaps the one over there in the Lake Paris area that might have been around, uh, might have been the, the ancestor of this one. You know where I'm going with this? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, why we want to do a little more study on this to see if it's actually, um, if it's truly, if its closest relative is truly the, the Ostrom montanum subspecies, um, which is, uh, you know, potentially the case, but it, it could also be, you know, more closely genetically related to the vinegar weed down at Lake Paris. And that's just something we don't know. And, you know, as you mentioned, um, there are other people that know more about this subject than me by a long shot, but you know, um, Hidden Lake is a unique place and um, something kind of got isolated there and, and, and to, you know, differentiated into, into what became Hidden Lake Blue Curls. And, um, you know, we'll just have to see if we can pick apart that puzzle and, and get, get more information on that. So, okay. Well, uh, quite a few questions have come up and uh, I'll start at the beginning here with uh, Kathleen uh, asks, isn't a vernal pool rather than, a, is it, isn't it a vernal pool rather than a lake? So that's an interesting discussion point. So um, 
two points on that. Um, typically, um, and we discussed this last week when I was out there with some people, um, typically a vernal pool is um, distinguished by depth and the substrate. And so the basin is uh, a granite basin rather than a clay basin. And um, a vernal pool is, if I remember correctly, uh, defined as something that is three and a half feet deep or less. And at its deepest hidden lake when it's full is a little over four feet deep. So we like the characteristic characterization of vernal lake just a little better. Um, the term vernal still applies. It sometimes makes it through an entire year with water in it and sometimes it dries up very early in the year. So that is a legitimate thing. So that's why we refer to it as a vernal lake. So is the uh, whether or not that lake is uh, episodically dry or not doesn't have anything to do with the definition? Um, no, that's just tied to the term vernal. Um, the pool versus the lake is really tied, I believe, more to the depth and to the substrate. Okay. Uh, Mary or Suzanne says, uh, when you mention weeds, do you try to remove them? Yes. So part of our monitoring is to look at, we, ha we have a, a, a a list of all the plants that we've ever recorded at Hidden Lake and we know what should be there and what shouldn't theoretically. And um, when we see some that looks out of place, and again, this is really the value of partnership with Rancho Santa Ana or, or California Botanical Garden is because our expert Naomi really knows what plants come from where and belong where. Um, we can ID um, those and seek them out and remove them. And, you know, this is another threat, frankly, from recreation to the site. And I, I will, it, it, I'm glad it was brought up um, that, you know, one of the things that visitors can do on a local level, whether it be at Hidden Lake or um, anywhere else in Mount San Jacinto State Park is they can clean their gear, their boots, their shoelaces, their camping gear of seeds that they picked up elsewhere hiking um, mud that might be on their boots or, or, or equipment um, and not bring it up the tram and let it fall off um, from where, the, you know, when they're hiking in the park, um, because that's one of the key ways that weeds spread. And we have collected two or three exotic plants. We haven't thankfully yet found anything invasive. And there's a distinction weeds Exotic plants are plants that are just not native there. Um, invasive plants are plants that are likely to take over and um, they're much more threatening. So um, it is something that we're looking at. And, um, you know, so far we've been able to hand pull everything that didn't belong. Okay. Uh, Tracy asks, are the remote side canyons searched for Hidden Lake Blue Curls? Um, we have looked um, around, yeah. And, you know, the other thing is that there are certainly no other vernal pools or ponds like Hidden Lake in the San Jacinto Mountains. So um, there definitely aren't any other places that have those exact site characteristics. Um, but we have looked around for them and, and haven't found any evidence of them. In fact, that was one of the ways that we were, you know, the, the, other populations of Ostrom, Montana were, were found, was looking for locations where hidden lake blue curls might be. Do they seem to be very sensitive to uh, not just this subspecies, but the other ones that, that were found in the Sierra and in the San Bernardino Mountains? Uh, are they within a fairly narrow elevational range? Um, I don't know enough about them to be able to answer that. I mean, of course, Hidden Lake Blue Curls only exist at Hidden Lake, so that's a very narrow elevational range. Um, but yeah. if there was a vernal pool or a vernal lake elsewhere in the San Jacintos, say a thousand feet higher in elevation, I can't venture guess whether that would have significant impacts on 
um, their success at a higher elevation or a lower elevation for that matter. It's just not something that we've been able to put a finger on. All right. Can you talk uh, a bit about the response of blue curls to wildfire? Threats to Hidden Lake blue curls would be. Um, yeah, that's Let, uh, that's too, That's another question. Yeah. Uh, does so, anyone know how it would respond? There you go. Yeah. So um, I don't know because Hidden Lake has not burned. Um, I will say that I am um, deeply involved in the. Uh, fire management program. I, I, I should say I am the fire management program at uh, California State Parks Inland Empire District. I am a trained resource advisor. So when there is a wildfire, I am at the incident command post or on the fire line advising the suppression agencies um, of the sensitive resources in our parks, whether it be Mount Santa Santa or Chino Hill State Park or anywhere else. And in the case of Hidden Lake, um, you know, it is our hope to keep fire out of there. And it's possible that fire would burn right through there and not be an issue at all. Um, it depends on the intensity of fire. Um, uh, a simple creeping ground fire, uh, my speculation would be that it probably wouldn't be a big deal, but I really don't know. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, we do request that, um, the fire suppression agencies avoid Hidden Lake with, uh, fire retardant drops. Um, we'd rather a wildfire creep across there than, um, have the Fosjack, uh, because of its chemical makeup be, you know, draped across there. Um, or even, you know, in the hillsides around it. Although we, we do approve uh, water drops in the basin, um, maybe not in the, the actual lake bed, but um, in the surrounding hills to slow fire as it's moving towards Sin Lake. Um, and, uh, you know, we ask that the suppression efforts that go in around there are use minimum impact suppression tactics, light on the land. Um, we don't want heavy handed uh, fire line constructed in there because it could affect, affect the drainage or erosion issues in the area. Um, and the other thing is um, when it's dry, in Lake looks like a perfect place to land um, a helicopter and dispatch fire crews from. Um, and we strongly urge against stuff like that happening in the Hidden Lake Basin. We, we advise that it's a safer spot um, and better for the resources, although there could yet be some impacts to the resources of the various meadows we have. But we, we suggest that Round Valley Meadow or Long Valley Meadow are better landing zones for helicopters and those types of resources when it comes to wildfire response. So. Um, we're actively engaged, whether it's myself individually or the superintendents and the wildfires. And um, we, we have a lot of concerns for Hidden Lake. Um, and, you know, we've had a good relationship. We also participate in pre-fire planning meetings with CAL FIRE and the Forest Service and um, build relationships. And so during the Cranston Fire and the Mountain Fire, we had um, really great support from those agencies when they were trying to put out the fire to try and meet our needs and concerns. Um, they helped me get out to Hidden Lake during the mountain fire and meet with the crew that was on site putting out the, or, you know, controlling the fire as it moved into Hidden Lake Basin. Um, they helped us um, when there was another fire potentially threatening Round Valley. Um, we you know, many people who hike the park regularly saw the silver building wrap around the two ranger stations uh, up in Round Valley. Um, so those relationships that we work to build before or in between fires with the suppression agencies really pay off when there's actually an incident. This uh, next question is related. Uh, if recreation were never an issue, this is what Katie asks, uh, what do you think the greatest threats to Hidden Lake Blue Curl would be? 
Um, I think it would be strictly um, the localized population size and limited area where it exists. And, um, you know, it's, it's tricky to talk about what climate change might do, but, um, you know, because it's all speculatory. Climate change affects different parts on the planet differently, of course. I, I, I'm, it, it's happening, in my view. People have different opinions on that, but it is a real thing, in my opinion. And, um, you know, we don't know what it's going to do to Mount San Jacinto. Indications are that um, in the San Jacinto Mountains, winter time temperatures are warmer. So we're um, seeing um, less snow at lower elevations um, and some higher temperatures in the summer. But the biggest thing is those, those winter lows. And, and so we get less snow and that affects the water in the basin um, potentially. And um, then there's the monsoonal uh, moisture that um, we see and this is anecdotal, and I'd actually look at, like to look into it a little bit more, and this would be where um, more monitoring outings per season um, would be valuable, is that um, I was out at Hidden Lake in July, and you know, conditions vis visually weren't that much different than they were last week when I was out there. But um, the Hidden Lake Blue Curl plants themselves were much smaller and in between July and now, we've had a little bit of precipitation in the form of monsoonal rains. And my speculation is, is that those monsoonal showers play a big part in not the germination of the plants necessarily, but the growth and the uh, flower and seed production um, later in the summer. Um, so uh, there's a possibility that climate change could affect the monsoonal flows uh, and when and how they come, and that could have some long-term impact on that. And I will add that, you know, recreation-wise, one of the things that we still hold a card to is if recreation itself starts to become an issue, we can withdraw the permitting process altogether and close the Hidden Divide Trail such that the only opportunities to go out there would be with uh, a state parks volunteer or staff for a guided tour, and it would be strictly a citable offense to be on the Hidden Divide Trail at all. So um, I hope that's incentive for people to treat that site with respect. Um, that being said, you know, someday maybe we'll be able to allow a higher number of users on that trail if recreation on the trail doesn't prove to be an impact to the plants. We'll just have to see over time. Okay, we have just a couple more questions. So, um, Hazel, is there any history of the plant being collected and used by the COIA? Um, I don't have any evidence for that. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't really have an answer for that. I just don't know. Okay. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, Tracy, a follow up to your one of your comments. Did he say who or how it's pollinated? That's an excellent question and it's actually been debated a, a bunch because we haven't witnessed any pollinators visiting the flowers. So there is some speculation that the plant is self-pollinating, which is kind of an interesting um, genetic adaptation. Um, and I am not well versed in that part of the science to really be able to elaborate on it. But as you know, most plants are pollinated by some, you know, wind or pollinator and the genetic material is moved from plant to plant and that distributes the genetic material in a certain way. Um, and in this case, um, would be very interesting to do a little bit more genetic work to see if um, there's a lot of genetic um, variation, um, and, and the, the words are escaping me, but there's terminology for the, um, you know, the, the genetic makeup of the plant. And it, it, it'd be interesting to do a little bit more work on that to see if uh, the likelihood that it's self-pollinated has 
how it impacts the genetic makeup of the plant. Is it more likely when plants are dioecious versus monoecious uh, can self, be self-pollinating? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Take me back to my college genetics class. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Ken, thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk and your head is full of a lot of information and it just comes rolling out. <laughs> So yeah, thanks, I Ann. enjoy talking about this stuff. So thank you for the yeah, opportunity. Yeah, this. and I hope uh, sometime uh, in the not too distant future, uh, we'll be able to engage you in some field trips up on the mountain. Yeah, and uh, I'll just make one more last comment and say, you know, reminder, if you're thinking about going to visit Hidden Divide, uh, Hidden Lake Trail, um, get your permit. Don't go out there without it. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we'll keep an eye on that for sure. All right, again, thank you very much, Ken. Okay, have a great evening. All right, everybody, thanks for attending. Very much appreciated. And with that, we'll say good night. Good night.